you know, in every single room in the emergency room, we have gloves, masks, and hand sanitizer. And all of a sudden, we noticed they were all missing. Hi, everyone. You're listening to Good Is In The Details, and I'm your host, Gwendolyn Dalski. And joining me today, once again, is the California... <laughs> <laughs> Organizing Director for California Yimby, that means yes in my backyard, Constantine Hatcher. I mean, Big I don't understand. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. What's happening here? I'm very offended right now. <laughs> okay, Constantine, today we're talking coronavirus, we're talking quarantine. So, where are we right now in terms of the politics of today or the coronavirus today? So, I think the key is that people... Are we all getting a thousand bucks from Mitt Romney? I mean, one, I'm loving that. Go Mittens. (laughs) I never thought I'd ever say that, (laughs) being I was in the Obama 2012 campaign. (laughs) and He was like our arch rival, our arch nemesis. But, you know, good old Mittens is looking pretty good these days, comparatively speaking. Mm -hmm. I mean, let us be clear that um, Republicans have supported a president that has left our nation incredibly vulnerable. Mm Mm-hmm by not addressing this issue with the level of seriousness that it really deserved. So he just put us back behind six weeks, so we're trying to scramble and catch up, which means it's going to be worse than it it should be. But, you know, in his defense, this was coming. It was coming regardless once that they weren't stopping that pandemic. But it just, the poor handling is going to result in in, um, real um, issues and, like, literally deaths for people that are most vulnerable. One thing we do know is that folks should stay off the streets and out of public as much as possible, that it's on a five-day delay, meaning that we don't know symptoms don't start for five days, so we don't know what the numbers are right now. And then you couple that with trying to catch up in the testing, and you know, testing is taking a long time, and, and we don't have enough of them. So... You know, we don't really know what the situation is right now. That's something that we should keep in mind is that if you're not feeling any symptoms, that doesn't mean you can go run around and say that you're healthy because you might be carrying it and then go and give it to somebody else. Absolutely. Okay. So I asked listeners, oh, I should say that after this, I have an interview with an ER nurse in San Diego. Her name is Rachel. Before we get to that, I asked some listeners um, what they are doing in this quarantine period. I want to say... Right now, I'm talking about it a little bit lightly. Um, If you are in the position where this is just an inconvenience or maybe you're bored and we're trying to come up with creative ways to deal with it, keep in mind some things that you can do. Like, let's just say if you are, for people who are really hurting, if you are going to, I suggest to clean out that one junk drawer. Everybody has a junk drawer. I don't care how organized and neat you are. Everyone has one. Go ahead and take care of it. Or maybe take a look at your closet. After this, there's going to be a lot of unemployment. You can take this time to maybe go through your closet and donate the clothes to a good cause. There are organizations that take clothes that are in good condition and give them to people who are about to go out on a job interview. So that's one idea that you can do. Um, I would also say for people in the service industry, they are going to be hit hardest by this financially and maybe you know, give a bigger tip than you normally would. Those are a couple things. Also, Dr. Jenna Kravitz, she was part of the episode, This Is Your Brain on Love. Um, It was very cool. On her Facebook page, she asked for people to post local businesses that other people could support. So I think that's also a really great idea because I think that after the After the health stuff, we are going to be feeling the economic repercussions of this for one to two years. And what economists have said that is different about this when it comes to a recession or we're officially in a bear market is that the solution to this has nothing to do with money, with economics. Right now, everything has to do with health. So those are just some notes. Uh, Before we get to the listener questions, Constantine, I see you looked up stuff from the CDC. What are you reading? Just, I mean, the thing about the virus is that it's it's literally transmitted through basically droplets from someone's coughing or sneezing. Okay. That's why they keep saying, you know, don't touch your face because, you know, you can either pull them from your mouth and now you're contaminating things that you touch or 
potentially uh, catch it the same way. So, you know, hand washing, staying away from people that are infected, but I think and then staying out of public spaces, you know, only go out as necessary until, you know, this thing gets under control, until we get a chance for the infrastructure to catch up. I think it's just the best way to proceed and really, you know, and taking this thing seriously. It's not no need for panic, but it's just a need for caution and um, really thinking about it's not about you if you're a healthy young person. It's about that you're like literally could be transmitting death to people that are older or, or whose immune systems are compromised. And so you don't want to be a death, a, a death uh Agent a of death, reaper. sort of like, right. <laughs> like, no one wants that, so don't do it. Um, I would take say care stop you. hoarding the toilet paper. <laughs> I had no idea that was coming. I had no idea. I mean, of all the things, I don't think, you know what, now that's going to be part of every zombie flick. Has so, that been part of any dystopian film? I mean, I I've feel never like, heard of it. you know, I don't know. It, you know, you see the in the, those movies, like, people are raiding the stores and yeah. whatnot. I've never seen them running out with toilet paper. But they don't, I feel like they need to emphasize the toilet paper situation a little bit more. <laughs> I think the, the note to self is keep a good, healthy stock of toilet paper on hand. Um, <laughs> think bulk. Um, don't shop your toilet paper day to day. Otherwise, <laughs> you can get caught in the pandemic. Um, but, you know, if you go out in the stores, um, grocery stores have changed their hours, as many of you already probably know. You know, like here in Cal- here in Los Angeles, it's uh, 8 in the morning to 8 in the evening for, like, our grocery stores to still allow them time to restock. Now, I've heard that they're actually can restock. The issue is not necessarily that they're running out. It's that so many people are panicking and getting it that they don't have time to get the goods to the store and on the shelves. And so that's the main issue. It's not that we don't have enough supply of these things. We have huge storehouses that have them. It's just that getting them to people is uh, is a tremendous challenge. So right. So if you don't panic, you will be able to get hopefully get some toilet paper. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wondering if this is going to be a moment in time where we're going to say, "Remember before this, what is something has changed?" And I was reading in the Atlantic. There is this article by. Caitlin Tiffany, and the article is called, You Have a Moral Responsibility to Post Your Boring Life on Instagram. And she is pointing to a cultural shift that's going on right now in that Instagram has traditionally been about showing your best self. But now what has happened is everybody is showing their most boring self and that we are maybe looking at social media a little bit more. I know I have been and I've actually posted a little bit more on stories lately. There was one that was just, it was just playing with one of the filters. That was it. That was my story. So one of the shifts, and she was saying it's a moral responsibility, and she is talking about that in this time that a lot of people, they are showing more of their day-to-day, the banality of existence, if you will. She writes, in a 2014 paper about Instagram, which found that faces tend to get far more likes than other types of photos. Researchers at Georgia Tech wrote, Even as babies, humans love to look at faces. Infants, barely minutes old, turn toward faces, sensing that they are important. A recent study from the University of Granada in Spain found that participants' heart rates increased when they looked at photos of faces, more so for photos of loved faces than for those of unknown ones, but always some. In Italy, people are leaning out of windows to look at one another. So in other words, there's a good thing at looking at people's faces. So it's more important now on Instagram. Oh, man, we're going to see more selfies. No, no more I mean, of the glam we, selfies. We're going to see a Let's lot more selfies. But I feel like they're going to be like, you know, more real. I think. That's what seems Have that, happen. you know, we, we'll see. I mean, it's going to be interesting to see. I think a couple of things I think about. One, as you read that quote. As baby Zadie is staring at me, now I know that it's she's just not looking at me at, like, who's this crazy person that is holding me? Um, but it's actually some kind of interest. <laughs> it's interesting <laughs> there. That's good to know. Um, but two, it highlights, I think, the importance of physical uh, contact. And I think it's, it's something that we have, as humanity, have taken for granted in this world of social media, like real, genuine human contact. And now having people be isolated where they don't they can't have that that right. interpersonal contact hopefully it encourages us to think a little more expansively about how we appreciate our neighbors how we think of others that 
share in this human condition right um beyond outside of cultural and uh racial and economic biased. I mean, that's the hope. The- well, that's one of the things with the viruses is that it does, you know, everybody's vulnerable. It doesn't matter if you're a wealthy business owner. It doesn't matter if you are, I guess, in the service industry or have it or in a gig economy. It doesn't matter what your station is in life. Everyone right now needs to pull together because the virus doesn't care. Yes, to a certain degree, I think. So not to a certain degree, I think that is absolutely right. Um but I would say with, with but, a caveat, uh-huh. because the virus, that those that are uh, more, that have less resources, that are more on the fringes of stability, right? You're talking about homeless populations. You're talking about those that are, um, that are uh, economically disadvantaged, right. that don't have the money to stock up on food but now and can't go out or those that are living, working out, you know, you know, hour to hour uh, gigs, you know, at minimum wage. And now their hours are being are gone away. And while now you're starting to see, you know, in some states like ours, like California, where you can apply for unemployment if your business is closed, that's still only going to give you a certain amount of, of money. There's a lot of concerns and, and hopefully we will see this would be more universal and it would be great if this was you know, done uh, across the board nationally, if we had the, the type of strong leadership that we should have, I'm a little biased. I will offer that disclaimer. But and I think we'll start seeing it more nationally. But, you know, definitely some other states are slower in making these moves. Here in California, we've had things like they, you know, and many cities have already started suspending uh, evictions, suspending, um, you know, for non-payment due to coronavirus, suspending foreclosures, suspending, um, you know, utility shutoffs, uh, yeah. kind of temporarily pausing all these things while people are not able to work and not able to pay their bills because they can't get paid because they can't go into work. So yeah. I, I think we're starting to make some of these progress. You know, I mean... The administration did to push back the tax date, which is great for us. If you're ninety really, days, yeah. yeah, which is great for businesses and the wealthy. It's very, um, <laughs> well, very it's thematic like- for this administration, <laughs> where their first concern is not the folks that are at the bottom of the barrel that are you're really struggling. So, but I think that um, it's a step in the right direction, and and yeah. and it is good for small business. Like I'm, I'm not I'm not poo pooing it all the way. I think there's a lot of folks that you know I got to file taxes. A lot of people have to file taxes that this is definitely positively affects but i think that we have to start getting real and there has to be like kind of a national more of a national leadership on um, some of these side effects of having people have to be really the nation quarantined well yeah the the la times recently i think maybe it was today or yesterday but talked about that suspension of utility bills or or let's say with rent. Yeah, rent evictions and right. foreclosures. Right, Property foreclosures. And, uh, and business foreclosures too. Like you can't foreclose or, you know, uh, evict a business either. Right. Which is great. And I think what has happened is that it has exposed this vulnerability. As you were talking about um, the homeless population or the people who have uh, work minimum wage, there are no health benefits. So the principle of the matter that everybody needs to be healthy for the economy to work that seems to be an interesting thing that's going to, maybe that's going to be one of the shifts. You know, this whole argument about healthcare, this has really shown how vulnerable we are. If you have people sick, they cannot participate in the economy. So as expensive as it seems to have more healthcare available for people, it's actually more expensive for people to be sick and not participating in the economy. That's 100% right. And the lack of coordination between on our, you know, being able to provide health care services, you know, that Mm -hmm. should be even across the board where, you know, one of the things that we're going to have to be that are going to be monitored and we're real danger of is, you know, since we're on this five day delay, you know, all the people that are sick now, right, (laughs) that didn't know that they were sick. That section of subsection of those folks that get sick enough to where they need to be on a respirator, find life saving um, uh, treatment. There's only so much of those that we have, you know, at our hospitals, and in certain places, the access to hospitals is very limited. So, we're, the burden that can be would be put on the medical system because it's a disparate system. It's not run, you know, it's not one unified type of uh, system where 
things can be rolled out easily. You have different hospitals that belong to different networks of insurance providers. And so there's all that additional navigation to, to roll out resources. And those resources are now disparate. And that kind of falls into the, if you are in an area that is not served by a hospital because you're in a, in a lower income area, you're going to be in trouble when that, that place, likely that hospital is less funded than, say, another hospital that's in a more wealthy area or they have more hospitals. Like if you look in L.A., if you look at how many hospitals are in South L.A. versus that are here in like West L.A. or some kind of more of the burbs and number per capita, you know, you can see that there could be issues if we have an Italian type of outbreak. Right. Um, in terms of being able to provide, because then the, now you're starting to have to make critical decisions about who gets to be on the respirator and who does not. And the thing is, we're only talking about people who are sick. So, you know, the first case in the U.S. was something that hit me was was January 21st. Mm-hmm. We were in the hospital. Zadie was born on the 22nd, January 22nd. So, and she had to that had to be a C-section. It mm-hmm. was, you know, as we were told by doctors, it was going to be ooh, on cue. She starts to. Coup. It would have been fatal had I gone into labor, Absolutely. which means that I had to be in the hospital. And so even though that has nothing to do with coronavirus, all of that has to be sterile. I need the medical attention in order for that to be possible. So this isn't just about the coronavirus. This is about the hospital being available mm-hmm. for other types of necessary Absolutely. surgeries. The wow. stress that can be put on our medical system. So this could, like, to your point, this could be, you know, everyone's Maybe been this like... Is the shift. Everyone's like, oh, no, we don't want to take... We love our health care. Well, this shows a very problematic uh, issue in yeah. our health care If you love your own, that's great. But you also have to make sure your neighbor is okay. Because if your neighbor... Na- in, in this case, right, you may have great insurance, but if your neighbor doesn't, guess what? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know? Okay. Um, Maybe it, well, I mean, that's the kind of thing that we learn. I know, you know, one of the classes that I teach is an engineering ethics class. And one of the shames whenever we do a case study is that something goes wrong and everyone figures things out. The laws shift after some sort of a disaster. And it's a shame because you can kind of see that the disaster was about to happen, but nobody cared because nobody had died. Mm -hmm. So it's not until somebody dies that then the laws start to kick in. So there might be a big... All of this talk and debates that we've been having about healthcare for a long time, I'm wondering if that's going to be the shift. And also, we'll enjoy more boring uh, Instagram stories. I mean, you know, and I, I mean, are they really boring though? I've seen some really funny. I mean, it's been hilarious. <laughs> People are creative. That uh, the guy with the, the guy that did the um, the, the, the one that uh, with the guy doing the the treadmill by doing spinning a little dish soap on, on his <laughs> on his floor. I mean, that was in a little water. That was hilarious. So you know, it's it's an encouraging uh, level of creativity. I think it's creating a community of people. What we need. I mean, we're talking about. You know, having really four years of just division. And so now getting to a place where about compassion and about um, community. Right. And I think, it's you know, sometimes in crisis, you have things get better. Sometimes out of crisis, wounds get healed. And maybe this, you know, as terrible as it is, and it's not something that you want to happen, looking at the silver lining in this very dark cloud is that maybe this ushers in a a newfound um, community and and civility in our country, which I think everyone could use. Ah, I love that. I hope so. Okay. So listeners, I asked on Instagram, speaking of Instagram stories, and on Facebook to DM me what you're doing during quarantine. Okay. So we have Becca writes that she is doing art, and she hasn't done art in a decade. Jill writes, she has two active boys, so I am now a WWE referee. Nice. (laughs) Okay. Jay says, quality time reading. Well, he was a philosophy major. Of course you're reading. What do you mean, quality time reading? You're reading anyway, right? Making music and hella binging. I got one uh, friend of mine, a colleague of mine, he has some friends in Italy, and he asked them, you know, as you know, they're in a, a tremendously uh, rougher spot than we are at this moment. They're, you know, under full quarantine where you can't hug each other, can't go out. Um, and, you know, as Italians, and this is kind of in literally in their words, the things that they love to do is spending time with their friends and going out and, and, and enjoying life. 
it's been particularly hard. But some of the things that they're doing is they're uh, they're doing meetings like Google Hangouts dinners with each other and having or having drink dates online with each other with their friend circle so they can actually see each other's faces there you know they're kind of this shared sense of community of of breaking bread or toasting each other i've seen things where people are doing fitness or yoga broadcasts john legend actually just did a concert for the world health organization all those ways that they're using the technology to still manage to stay connected they even had uh, some flash mobs where everyone starts singing on their balconies in, in all the cities around Italy at the same song at the same time. Oh, that's cool. So just, you know, they're finding a way to stay connected. There are those things out there, I think, that are great for people to find, whether it's like, you know, uh, group fitness classes. I got to someone is putting on like a Thursday noon dance party <laughs> where That's for like great. an hour people just, just load up your video chat and you know it's going to be a Zoom meeting and everyone's going to uh, we should maybe look for Zoom for maybe some sponsorship. I'm, we're really giving them some heavy uh, promotion here. But anyway. You hear that, Zoom? <laughs> doing a Zoom like dance party at Thursday noon time, right? Just to have that shared sense of community, a shared sense of fun. Um, and I think that's really important. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. Okay, Bree says, homeschooling a seven-year-old, like full-on homeschool and trying to work at home full-time, zero relaxed time, (laughs) haha. I think, Bree, I think I've heard from a couple of other people, you know, I'm thinking of quarantine and, or staying at home and is there any relaxed period? I better (laughs) remind myself that there's lots of parents out there who are working remotely and also now becoming teachers, becoming educators for their children. Okay, Regina writes, we are doing schoolwork, learning outside the classroom, teaching to wash clothes, garden, cook. Ooh, what are you cooking? As well as watching baby videos from 17 years ago. Oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Damn, I wish I had more baby videos of my 17 and 20-year-old. Let's see. Jim writes that he's reading. I'm a big fan of people who are reading. Obviously. Yeah. I mean... So on brand. I, uh, I don't know if you know this about me, mm-hmm. but I'm an introvert. No. And introverts, a lot of introverts love reading. No uh, way. I am reading, gone? since you asked. I did ask. I'm reading the, the memoir, Educated, which is a very cool book. Um, that reminds me, I wanted a little book club for the pod. If you're interested, you can be part of it on patreon.com slash good is in the details. I'll just throw that out. Get it. Um, <laughs> All right, so Marianne writes, family time. So I think a lot of people um, are going to have some, maybe some family quality time that they haven't had in a while because they're all obliged to be around each other. I know Amy writes that that is what she is doing. I'm just also obsessively watching the news she texts. I am too. I'm trying to stay away from it now, though, so it doesn't drive me too crazy. But it's hard. And... Let's see. And then Vanessa writes, mama, daughter, Zumba and baking, daddy, daughter, cooking dinner, some soccer time outdoors, family reading, and let's see, a writing assignment, maybe watching an older movie. Hey, that's not a bad idea. But yeah, I think that a lot of the family time might be kind of cool. I like the cooking idea. Um, Just try a new recipe. We eat out so much, so having the restaurants shut down might be an interesting thing where we all have to turn to and try to figure out how to the art of preparing our own food again. Okay. Let's move on to the interview with the ER nurse, Rachel. Hello. Hi, Rachel. Hi. Hi, this is Gwendolyn. Hi. Hi. Um, So what is your position? Let me just start out with that. I am an emergency room RN. I think something I want to ask is what has your experience of the virus or the pandemic been? So we get a lot of stuff from media, from politicians. What are you getting or what's your point of view? I think that, I mean, I think it's overwhelming as a whole for, you know, everyone right now. And then especially working in the emergency room, the issue is, is that we really don't know. And so when it first started, it was like, you know, we're talking about it, um, you know, it's just like a topic of conversation that we were having this is like weeks ago. And then all of a sudden I felt like it just blew up and, you know, it was scary at 
first because you have the patients coming in that say, you know, that they were exposed or they were coming in with flu-like symptoms, but they had been in a country that was listed as one of the as the top countries that, you know, that was like the places not to visit. So we put them under people under investigation. Okay. So PUI. And, but then that is scary in itself too, because we didn't really know how to treat them. So we're, you know, we're putting them in private rooms and every day, every 30 minutes, it seemed like they were coming out with new information on how to protect ourselves. And so from like, I guess the big, like maybe last Thursday when it like was really hit hard, I think to all of us in healthcare, it was that we were wearing um, like N95 masks with goggles and gowns and gloves and then the next day it was changed oh you need to be wearing like a papper hood with you know maximum protection when you're doing like the nasal and oral swabs for this patient oh wow and then yeah and then it got changed again that no just the n95 with the goggles and i believe that today it's now changed again to it's a droplet so it's going to be more of like a surgical mask with a gown and gloves. Okay. When you see what's exactly. happening in Italy, what is going through your mind? Do you see us going in that trajectory or no? I'm just like, I'm really honestly not sure. I I, mean, I hope that we are able to contain it as much as we can, but I also don't think that we were prepared. I mean, we now have like everything hidden, like as far as the supplies we need. I don't think that we were necessarily prepared. And so... Again, when this first came out like, a couple weeks ago, when people were starting, it was more of a hot topic. You know, in every single room in the emergency room, we have gloves, masks, and hand sanitizer. And all of a sudden, we noticed that they were all missing. All our masks were going, our hand sanitizers were missing, and so our department really had to lock it down, and we were unable to keep masks at bedside and hand sanitizer at bedside, and... Um, we went through, like, I don't even know the exact statistics what they said, but we went through, like, a month of supplies within a week of working because people were taking it. Oh, wow. Patients. And yeah, just, it was really crazy. So now we're on limited supply, and, you know, we can't have hand sanitizer in the rooms anymore. And if we need a mask, we have to check it out. Either it's under it's under lock and key, basically, the masks are, which is scary to know that we're maybe not going to be protected in the future if this continues um, for as long as it's going to continue. You know, we don't really know. Oh, my goodness. But, and then with the changing, what the CDC is recommending for our protection, it's changing all the time. So it's like we don't even know what the right protection is to be wearing So at when what time and what yeah. So when somebody comes in and they, you know, they're suspected of having the virus, um, how long does it take from when they get in the door to when they can be tested or you can figure it out? So right now, it, which is really good, is that people are normally calling ahead of time. Okay. And um, which we recommend calling ahead of time, letting us know that you're on your way to the hospital with, you know, you're having respiratory symptoms, you've been having fevers, you are possibly in contact. And so now we're, we're meeting people at their cars and putting them in a wheelchair gurney, depending on how sick they are, bringing them right to a room and um, where they'll be immediately assessed. And if the doctor seems that, uh, deems that it's necessary that the patient needs to be tested, they're tested, I mean, within probably the hour or two okay. of arriving to the emergency room. Okay. Wow. I'm sorry. I'm kind of blown away by the lock and key for a lot of the supplies. I was just wondering, um, also from the media, is there anything from your point of view where there's, uh, let's do some myth busting, any, any myths to bust? Um, that everyone needs a test. I mean, <laughs> okay. I think that if you're having mild symptoms to stay home and self quarantine, I just think that people, um, to really be mindful of themselves, obviously their hand hygiene, but the people that they can possibly expose themselves to expose themselves to if maybe they're young and they're just like feeling a little bit ill, uh, but just to really do the self quarantine and not expose the people that are elderly or that might have a history of respiratory symptoms 
And if you are well enough to stay home and you don't think that you need to go to the emergency room, just stay home um, so you're not putting everybody else in the emergency room at risk what or do in the you, hospital. Yeah. There, we aren't allowing any visitors now in the hospital. Okay. So um, that reduces the risk of exposure to you know, multiple people, but there's people coming in that just want to be tested or they're having symptoms and I think they just want to be told that they have it. I think the best you know, thing is just stay at home and write it out for 14 days and you know, if you really need to seek emergency care and you're feeling short of breath and you're feeling you can't breathe, then definitely come to the emergency room. So are nurses and doctors being tested as well? Not that, not at our hospital, not that I'm aware of at our hospital. Um, I know that they are in other hospitals and I know that there has been some exposures at other local hospitals to healthcare workers, but not at ours. What do you think we're going to learn from this? Um, I think that we'll learn uh, learn uh, definitely good hygiene practices. Uh-huh. I think that just washing your hands frequently and, you know, when you're sick, staying away from people, people are going to see the effect of what that could, like, that goes a long way. Um, I think that we'll also see people are able to not necessarily, I mean, I guess necessarily take care of themselves at home without seeking an emergency room visit. They can call their doctor or um, get other means of medical advice and just go into the emergency room. I know a lot of people do that just as like a, maybe like a comfort that they're going to go to the ER um, when they necessarily don't really need to go to the emergency room. So I think that will be good. Um, Do you think this, uh, do you think this is overblown at all? Like all the closures of the restaurants, the gyms, the shows, do you think it's too much or is it just right? I'd like to hope it's too much, but I think it's just right. Honestly, I think that I, I just think that we don't know. We don't know how this is going to like with the flu, we're able to track it. We know the flu, it comes with the flu season. Um, we can estimate our numbers of deaths and, you know, severe illnesses from the flu. You know, we follow Australia's flu season. So we're, we're able to track and trend the, the flu. Um, and however, this has never been before. So I think that we're unable to, it's the unknown of it, which I think it makes it really scary for, you know, just everyone. And they're trying to contain it the best that they can. And I think that what they're doing is correct. Because, I mean, we just don't know. It is scary. It's really scary, but we don't know. <sighs> okay. I also was going to say, you know, I think the biggest thing for me is that working in healthcare, we're working, or at least us working in the emergency room and working or in the direct contact with patients that are possibly um, have COVID-19 is the effect that it has on our family because, you know, we're going home to our family, our kids, our husbands, wives, parents, you know, boyfriends, girlfriends, and what that is anxiety provoking for them because they don't know how we're exposed at work and if we're protected and they're watching the news and they're seeing other nurses complaining about how they don't have the proper PPE. And I think that's been the most hard thing is trying to let my family know that I'm, you know, we're going to be okay, that, you know, we're doing the best that we can, but just to like let them, yeah, just let them know that we're okay because they're worried about us. This is our profession. So it's kind of, you know, you're stuck between the rock and a hard place. Yeah. Figure out how to navigate that with your family. We're exposed in the emergency room. We're exposed to a lot of different, you know, illnesses. We're exposed to tuberculosis, pertussis, like chickenpox, like things that are not around anymore. You know, we're constantly, and that's the risk that we take for working in the emergency room. But I think, again, with this media and how this is so unknown, you know, we know about tuberculosis. We know about all these different um, diseases, but since this is so unknown, I think that's why it's just so scary for people and, you know, even for us because we don't know. I know they say that we can't get sick, but then you hear on the media that there's firefighters in critical condition that were exposed. So it's scary all around, but um, hopefully that the evidence that they've been trying, like the evidence that they've collected and that uh, they're properly telling us the, the proper PPE to be wearing and 
Um, we can only go off of what like the CDC says. Right. Well, Rachel, thank you so much for all of your work. Thanks for sharing this for my listeners. And we really appreciate everything that you do. Oh, thank you. Oh, so stay healthy. Good luck to you. Thank you so much. Okay. If you need anything else, just let me know. Okay. All right. Have a good night. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right. Bye. Thank you so much for listening. Constantine, thanks for joining. Thank you for having me. And if you have any questions about this episode, you can email me at goodisinthedetailspod at gmail.com. You can tweet me at gdolsky. And if you would like to support the show uh, for as little as two bucks, you can go to patreon.com slash goodisinthedetails. And I don't know, stay safe, wash your hands, check in on your folks. Don't cough or sneeze on people. Don't cough or sneeze on people. Keep your tush inside. Yes. Okay. Bye.